There we go. Good morning, Astronomy 1010, and welcome back to our second lecture, but our first week of lecture. I call it lecture one. For starters, let's see how many of you followed my instructions from last class, and how many of you have your Casio FX260 calculator. Hold them up now, show me what you got. I wanna see it. One, two, three, four. Anyone else? I have Man. mine, I just don't have it on my Zoom. You don't have your calculator on your Zoom? Oh, there we go. No, yep. like I don't have oh, my, yeah. All right, Jamie, that's what I'd like to see that. Okay. You're the operators with your pocket calculators. Now listen, um, if you do not have your Casio FX260 solar calculator, you're doing it wrong. Congratulations, you started off badly, okay? I need to train you on how to use this tool. I can't train you if you don't have it. It costs $10. That's less than the price of a pack of smokes. You can get a Casio calculator and discover all kinds of secrets of the universe. Um, I don't know what you're gonna do if you don't have this. I guess you'll just sit there and do this. Uh, not helpful, not helpful. What's helpful is punching the buttons when I tell you, okay? So I, I don't know how I can stress this anymore. You need this, you need this now. So if you don't have it, you better have it by Wednesday and you're gonna have to muscle your way through this uh, lecture today. Secondly, this week is the start of shit getting real, okay? Uh, that's where we have a lecture on Monday, followed by lab one, which we're going to do today after lecture. And then on Wednesday, we'll have the second part of lecture one, followed by our first homework, which we are going to do together. We need to have those turned in as soon as possible. And I know not everyone is watching this lecture live. Some of you will be watching the recording later. Um, you have until Saturday to get me lab, lab one and homework one. The reason is that I do all of my grading on Sunday. Now, I had some labs and homeworks with my other class last week, and there were some people who were confused about what was going on, and they started writing me on Saturday night and saying, oh, can I have an extension on lab one and homework one? And I had to tell them no, you cannot have an extension. And the reason why is the administration has, has put 28 students in each of my sections and I have six sections. I have 168 students this semester. And if you multiply that by two, that's like 330 something homeworks uh, per week. So I can barely do that. Even if I grade one paper a minute, it'll take me four or five hours. I can't have people turning in late homework because I just don't have the physical time to grade more than that many papers. It's kind of stressful on me. So sometimes you just have to get your shit together by a certain time. And luckily you have a couple of days leeway. You're getting your lecture on Monday and Wednesday. I think getting these things done by Saturday is a reasonable goal. Once I grade my papers on Sunday night, which I do late at night, uh, around midnight on Sunday, I close out the assignments and you cannot submit them anymore. Now, for those of you who are here with me live, I don't think that's going to be a problem for you guys, Brianna, Naomi, Valentina, Austin, because you guys will probably do it with me and submit it right then. What I'm really doing is I'm talking to all those people in the studio audience that are watching this video later, and I'm probably really trying to talk to the people who aren't even going to watch the video and I can't talk to them because they don't do anything. So that's gonna be the real problem. I'm worried about that. Um, <clears throat> please don't be one of those people. I'd like to see you have a good semester with me. Okay, uh, if there are no other questions, let's get started. I want to review what we talked about at the end of our lecture last time. I taught you guys scientific notation. Let's see if y'all remember how that works. Suppose I put a random number up on the board. Suppose I put the number about one, two, three, four, five, point six, seven, eight, nine. Could any of you hot shots, besides Austin, who should pipe down, could any of you other people, like my new friends, uh, Josie, Brianna, Kiana, Austin, any, well, I'm sorry, not Austin, John, any of you folks, can you put that in the scientific notation for me? Who's got skills? Jenna, do you have skills?
I could try. All right, let's try. Okay. Um, so is that a decimal? Yeah, it's a decimal. Yep. So would it be like 1.2345 times? Wait, what happened to 6789? Yeah, that's what I'm confused about. I'm not too you, sure. You keep those numbers too. That's all oh, okay. part of the change. Okay. Six, seven, eight, nine, it's all there. I mean, in general, we're going to end up rounding, but this is just without rounding, okay? Okay. Then what? Um, and then we'll say times 10. Okay. And what's our power? Um, one, two, three, four. Is it four? Very good. Of four? Because okay. the decimal point started where it started, there, and it moved to over here. And that means it hopped one, two, three, four places, right? So that's 1.2345678 times 10 to the four. Very good. Okay, so apparently you do have skills. I'm impressed. Um, we're going to be practicing this in our lab today. This is such an important skill that uh, we need to sort of try a few examples together before we can uh, do anything else in this class. Um, I also want to mention right now that we can use scientific notation. May I erase this? Josie, are you still taking notes or you need a second? No, you're good. I don't know what the yes and the no means. <laughs> Josie, I'm all set. Oh, okay. Give me a thumbs up if you're good, okay? I'm erasing this. We can use uh, scientific notation. Today, we're going to be using it for really tiny numbers as well. Um, let's take an annoying number like 0 0.000234. That's kind of annoying. That's kind of like something I don't want to have to look at when I'm grading your papers. <laughs> Um, do you guys know what the lead digit is here? What's the lead digit? That's right, John. Two, because zeros are not allowed to be a lead digit. So that means we would transform this 2.34. Now, here's the deal. We use negative powers of 10. Negative powers of 10 mean tiny numbers to represent small numbers. And usually the rule is if you move over one, two, three, four, that's 10 to the minus four. That tells you how many decimal places your, uh, your decimal point moved, okay? Um, for those of you who forgot math stuff, 10 to the minus one means one over 10 to the one or a 10th. That's what uh, 10 to the minus one means. 10 to the minus two, means one over 10 squared, which is 100th. You'll notice that every time I raise 10 to a new negative power, the one occupies the third space after the decimal, okay? And so forth and so on. Here we moved it minus four places. When we plug negative signs into our Casio calculators, let's all take a peek at our Casio calculators for a second. We do not use the minus key, but we instead use the negative key plus minus right there, okay? So for instance, if I did 2.34, remember when we do times 10, we use exp key, that's what the exp key for, times 10 to the minus four. And if I hit equals, but oop, all right, I clearly botched that, sorry. Let me try that again, 2.34 exp, negative four. And if I hit equals, nothing happens. It, it leaves it in that uh, scientific notation form. Uh, remember, one of the most important keys I'll train you on today is your EXP key. EXP means times 10. Never forget that. EXP key means times 10. There's no more typing times 10 in this class. There's only EXP. Okay, that was a little sort of short review there uh, of what was up. Now, if you don't have a calculator, if you're a bad boy and a bad girl, then you should probably do something about it, like use a scientific calculator on your iPhone or something. Is that going to work all semester? No, that's going to screw you up. You're learning, you're already going to be at a disadvantage by not having your Casio. So try not to uh, let that persist for more than a, a single class. You want to have that by Wednesday. All right.
Enough about scientific notation. That was a little reminder of where we left off last time. Today, we're going to learn some vocabulary to talk about uh, the rotation of the nighttime sky. We're going to learn a whole different grab bag of things that you need to know to talk to me about astronomy. Um, <clears throat> let's start by thinking about the spinning Earth here, OK? If you were to leave Earth and travel out into outer space and then look down at the Earth from the North Pole, you would discover that the Earth is spinning on its axis counterclockwise as seen from above, OK? So it's spinning counterclockwise. And in addition to Earth's spin, its axis spin, it also has an orbital uh, revolution around the sun. Here we could uh, probably stand to look at one of my diagrams. Let's go ahead and do this here. Slide 14 is what I'm thinking about. If you look from the North Pole of space, you'll discover that Earth is spinning on its axis, and it's spinning counterclockwise, as seen from above. It's also orbiting around the sun, and it orbits counterclockwise. This is going to be a thing that you see all throughout the solar system. Planets spin counterclockwise, and they orbit around the sun counterclockwise. They're all kind of going in the same direction. There's a reason for that. It has something to do with the formation of the solar system. There's one or two exceptions, but I'll get to those later. For now, this is a good place to start because we can think about the fact that the axis spin of Earth is what's going to give rise to the day. That's the daily motion of the sun and stars. And then there's this secondary motion, this motion around the sun, which gives rise to the year. And I'm going to start by having us uh, think a little bit about Earth's orbit. So let's title this section of your notes, Earth's orbit. You should be writing down everything that I write down. It's good for you. So first of all, we have Earth's axis spin. And the axis spin gives us the day, which is equal to 24 hours. I think most of you probably knew that. If not, well, you're getting your money's worth today, let me tell you. Um, this thing that I'm showing you here is important. I'm putting a box around it. Even though that you, most of you know there's 24 hours in a day, I want to introduce to you this concept of a conversion factor. This is your first of many conversion factors that will re relate one set of units, days, to another set of units, hours. At first, I'm going to start off gentle with you and tell you things you already know. Then I'm going to be less gentle, and I'm going to start telling you about weird stuff that's confusing, OK? What's important is you get in the habit of every time I show you a conversion factor, I want you to write it down in the same way that I write it down, and I want you to use my abbreviations for the units. Basically, just do whatever I do as best as you can, OK? So the axis spin gives us the day. And then there's the orbital period of Earth. That's its revolution around the sun, its yearly motion around the sun. That gives rise to a year, which is approximately 365 days. Now, in a week or two, we are going to get into some real nitty gritty uh, about timekeeping, at which point I will teach you that there are actually two types of year. There's a sidereal year and a tropical year. They have slightly different variations. Those of you in the background who've taken my 1020 class, we'll find that although some of this stuff is stuff that you saw last semester because we have common uh, themes, there's going to be a few detours that you didn't get in 1020. So don't get too cocky, Austin. Um, I also mentioned that if you look from above, from the north of space, that everything seems to be uh, spinning counterclockwise. So let's take a moment to define directions in space. Um, here's the north pole of Earth. From now on, anything that's roughly in the direction of Earth's North Pole, we will consider that to be north in space. Anything that's in the direction of Earth's South Pole, that's going to be considered south in space. East and west are a little bit weird. Take a look at the United States here. You guys know that the Earth is spinning counterclockwise from above, and that means 
Earth is rotating in the direction of Rhode Island, and uh, it's sort of California is trailing behind us, okay? So you guys might know from traveling around the country that Rhode Island sees the sunrise before California does, okay? So currently in this configuration, east is pointing in the direction of my finger gun here, okay, in that way. But if I rotate 12 hours later, now I am looking at the United States, not you, and now east is pointing like so. So east and west seem to be all messed up if you're in outer space, unless you put your best noodle on it and you start thinking abstractly and you think, holy smokes, what if what if I defined like this, this direction, this spin as east, then east would always have the same direction in outer space, it would be counterclockwise. That would be a weird thing to think at first, but the more you thought that think, the better it would sound, okay? So why don't you just take it from me if you didn't understand anything I just said there. From now on, we will define in, in astronomy, in outer space, on the sky, counterclockwise. is defined as east. Notice I've used the triple equal sign. That means it is defined as such. So don't argue about it, okay? Of course, that also implies that, that clockwise is west, okay? That's gonna come up in more than a few places in our class. So it's worth writing down. All right. Um, Let's take a look at the orbit of Earth. The orbit of Earth is almost, but not quite, a perfect circle. Uh, in a few moments, I'm going to come up with a name for this almost a perfect circle. It's called the ecliptic. But before I get to that definition, let me give you a few other definitions. Um, if Earth's orbit is not quite a perfect circle, that means there's going to be a point in its orbit that's a little bit closer to the sun. We call that perihelion. And there's going to be a point that's just a little bit farther from the sun. That's called aphelion. Those are some good vocabulary words for us to write down. So let's do that. So there is a perihelion. That's the point closest to the sun in orbit. Earth has a perihelion, so do the other planets like Mars. And then there's a aphelion. Aphelion is the point farthest from the sun in orbit. Okay, so you've learned some fancy no vocabulary words. That's nice. That means we can have an intelligent discussion with each other when I, when I use these fancy words. Let me just uh, give a moment here for you guys to catch up to me because I need to erase before I can go forward. Valentina, it looks like you're writing. Give me a thumbs up when you're good. Okay, nice, nice. And an award-winning smile. I love it. Uh, anyone else? Can I erase here or does anyone need a second? Kim, you good? All right, I'm erasing. Shout at me now. Okay, so because Earth's orbit is almost a perfect circle, we know there's a perihelion, we know there's an aphelion, it might be a good idea for us to define the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. Um, it's going to be kind of a, a, a new unit of measurement that we can measure out the solar system with. But before I get to this astronomical unit, let's do a little lecture on metric units of distance. Because, of course, in a, in a science class like astronomy, we're going to use metric units because they're easily... Uh, transferable into many other types of units, right? So we're going to introduce some metric units of distance 
And probably the gold standard in the, uh, the system international, the sort, of, the sort of default metric units would be the meter. Whose abbreviation is 1M. A meter is kind of like a yard, except it's better, okay? This chalkboard, I'm oh, sorry, this dry erase board is close to a meter in width. Um, for me, a meter is roughly the distance. So just to give you a sense, from my shoe to my belt, okay? So my leg is roughly one meter, one meter long. That's a, that's a sort of good uh, reference point. The meter is the gold standard um, for, for metric units of length. And a human being is approximately two meters tall. You'll notice that on my meter stick here, they've subdivided um, the meter into a bunch of smaller units called centimeters. A centimeter is roughly the width of your pinky fingernail. You can see my pinky fingernail is about a centimeter across. And in, in a meter stick, we have exactly 100 centimeters. So let's write that down. Sometimes we want to measure even smaller things than centimeters are good for. That's when we might want to bust out some millimeters. So uh, hold on a second. Class, uh, it's going to be a good idea while you're, I don't know if you, I said this last time, I probably should have. If you could buy just a simple, cheap ruler that has some metric units, some centimeters and millimeters, you're going to find that that comes in handy all the damn time in this class. So let me see how well I can zoom here. I'm going to change the focus on my camera's lens so I can get, do a zoom in here. And you guys can see that millimeters are the little tiny tick marks in between zero and one centimeters. There's 10 millimeters per centimeter. A millimeter is the sort of thing I would use if I had to measure the length of an ant, okay? An ant would probably be two to six millimeters long, depending on whether it was a carpenter ant or a fire ant or whatever. Okay, so millimeters are a thing. We're going to be using those in our lab. Buy a 50 cent ruler at Job Lot. You won't regret it. It's only 50 cents, okay? And um, one centimeter contains 10 millimeters. Let's put box, well, we don't have to put boxes around these. One meter contains a thousand millimeters, okay? Milli means a thousandth. When we want to measure something like the radius of a planet, and our entire class is kind of about planets, if you want to measure the distance from South America to North America or the radius of a planet, meters are too, too small. They're too clumsy. That's when we want to bust out our kilometers, OK? A kilometer is 1,000 meters. You'll remember last time I gave you some powers of 10 I defined kilo as 10 to the power of three. And I'm being consistent there. I happen to know from teaching this class a lot that we're gonna need to use this conversion factor all the damn time in this class. So why don't you go ahead and put some stars next to it? That's gonna be a conversion factor that you need to use over and over again. You'll probably memorize it by the end of this class, not because you wanted to, just because you use it so much. Okay, now that I've defined kilometers, I can make an even better meter stick if I consider the distance between Earth and the sun. To measure distances within our solar system, kilometers are too clumsy. The, the average distance between the Earth and the sun is called an astronomical unit. And it's, it's uh, 150 million kilometers, all right? And this is gonna be a sort of new meter stick that we can use to measure out solar system like distances. It's going to be very helpful for us. So let's let's define that here. The astronomical unit or 1 AU is defined as 
the average distance between Earth and the sun. Its measured value, and there's a story behind that that I don't have time to tell you right now, is 150 million kilometers. Now, students, I seem to vaguely remember having a rule in this class, a rule about big numbers. I hope I made you write that down at the end of last lecture. Does anyone remember the rule? You do, Brianna? What was the rule? Use scientific notation. When it's bigger than what? A thousand, I think. Bigger. A million. A million. Oh. A million is the cutoff. Just a general rule of thumb. It's good taste, OK? So a thousand's cool, 10,000's cool, Brianna. A million's too much. We're clearly more than a million here. So Brianna, you have just volunteered yourself to put this number into scientific notation. Can you handle that? Yeah. All right. So tell me what to do. OK, so it's 1.5 times 10 to the eighth. Excellent. So let's write down what she just said. <laughs> OK. What Brianna just did there is she put this number into what is called proper form. In proper form of scientific notation, you have a lead digit between one and nine. Everything else is kept after the decimal point, And then you have times 10 to some power. Usually, uh, when the book or when a Usually, the default mode is to put scientific notation to standard form. For instance, uh, in your textbook, which John was talking to me about earlier, they have a, um, an appendix with some useful numbers. It's Appendix C. Uh, I try to give you these numbers in our lecture, so you shouldn't have to, sorry, not Appendix C, Appendix A. The very first appendix is useful numbers. And you'll notice they have more precision than I did, but notice they put one astronomical unit sort of into proper form, a single lead digit. However, um, one does not have to use proper form. Let's take a peek here. Let's try to put one AU into our calculators. Let's do 1.5, punch after me. When I punch, you punch. That's your job, okay? So 1.5, when it comes for the times 10, we hit EXP. And then we hit eight, hit equals, boom. There it is, 150 million, all right? Y'all got that? All right, now, Brianna, what if we were weird? What if we wanted to do things different because we're special snowflakes or something like that? Then, then we could, if we wanted to be weird, we could have slid the decimal point back here. We could have stopped there. And although it's weird, we could have written 15 times 10 to the 7 kilometers. That's weird, but OK. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just weird. So watch me now. 15 exp7, if I hit equals, same number. All right. What if we were like me? What if we were really weird? If we were really weird, we might even be tempted to do something nuts, like slide the decimal point back to here. And then we could write one astronomical unit is equal to 150 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. Let's put a box around that. We're going to put a box around it because that, my friends, is good math styles. See, 
I often like to slide my decimal point until my powers of 10 remind me of those special words that I put in the table at the end of last week's lecture, right? Um, you guys remember that 10 to the power of six is what? What's 10 to the power of six? How do we say that in English? A million? Says Ryan. Hell yes. So in other words, Ryan, when I read this number in my brain, I read it as one AU is equal to 150 million kilometers. I'm always jiggling my zeros around until they end up in terms of millions or billions of trillions because I like it, because it's cute, okay? And so you're often going to see me write it that way. Uh, I need to erase this, so take a moment to catch up to me here. Michael, give me a thumbs up when you're ready to move on. All right. Let's transfer that back up to the top of the board here. I want to do some things with you. So probably the, the, the better way to define an astronomical unit is I could say an astronomical unit is a length of distance equal to 150 million kilometers. That's an important conversion factor that's probably new to many of you, all right? What does an AU do for me? Let's tiptoe around the solar system and find out. Um, you'll notice that if I measure the distances to planets in the inner solar system, uh, I discover that the numbers are kind of easy to remember. Now, I want to warn you guys, anytime I see a number that's between 0 and 1, I always think of it in my mind as a percentage. And you might want to do the same thing. So um, you'll notice here that the distance from the sun to Mercury is about 40% of an AU. The distance from the sun to Venus is 70% of an AU. Earth is obviously one AU by definition. The distance from the sun to Mars, 1.5 astronomical units. Watch what happens when we get to the, uh, when we get to the outer solar system. In the outer solar system, the distances become intense, but they become great, but they're also easy to remember numbers. The distance to Jupiter is five astronomical units. The distance to Saturn is twice that. It's 10 AU to Saturn. The distance to Uranus is 20 astronomical units. Neptune is 30 astronomical units away. Now, Pluto's orbit is really squishy, but if you average the perihelion and the aphelion, notice my use of our vocabulary, if you measure the closest and farthest distances, on average, Pluto ends up being about 40 astronomical units uh, from the sun. And if you think of Pluto as being the radius of our solar system, well, by George, the entire solar system can be thought of as being about 100 astronomical units across. And that's cool, because any two distances we measure in the solar system will then be a number between one and a hundred, and that's pretty, e or zero and a hundred, that's usually pretty easy to work with, right? Um, in fact, the solar system does extend well beyond the orbit of Pluto, as the following slide here will demonstrate. Uh, it's about a hundred astronomical units, sorry, um, Pluto is 40 AU away, if you travel out 100 astronomical units, you get to the edge of what's considered our solar system, the heliopause. But there's even a cloud of icy comets called the Oort cloud. And these icy comets kind of orbit around the sun and occasionally drift in here. They're, they're not your everyday comet. They're so-called long period comets. By the time you get to the next star, that's a whole different bag of beans. That's like a million AU away. But you have to take my astronomy 1020 class if you want to leave the solar system. That's another 550 bucks, okay? So uh, for now, we're going to stay inside the solar system as much as possible. And that means numbers between 1 and 100 will work for us. 
However, from time to time, I'm going to need you guys to do some basic math problems. And I'm going to test you right now, sort of train you and see what you can handle, OK? Let's try a sample question of the sort that I might want you to be able to do, say, on a homework or on a test. Question. If Pluto is 40 astronomical units away, How many kilometers is that? I think this is a pretty easy problem, but you know, you guys don't have the training that I do, so it might not be easy for everyone out there. Before I show you my method of solving this problem, I wanna see if anyone in my audience, besides Austin, who better know how to do this, because he's been trained by me, uh, the others, the rest of you, I'd like to know if any of you would know how to solve this without my help. Could anyone handle such a problem? Is it just um, 150 million times 40? That's right, Michael. Michael, you're having a good day. And when you're having a good day, you can, <laughs> you can see what to do. It's clear in your mind and you do it and you win and everything's awesome. Okay. Now the number of times that's going to happen to you uh, in this class, they're going to dwindle. All right. So sometimes Today you have a good day. Last day. It'll happen. Huh? Today is the last day it'll happen. Yeah. Austin knows because he's been through this, right? So what's going to happen is things are just going to get weirder and harder to conceptualize sometimes. And that's why you're going to need a strategy for solving uh, problems like this. Even though Michael knew how to do this, I think it's better to explain my method using an easy problem rather than a hard problem. I have a method that we are all going to use to solve problems like this. It's called dimensional analysis. And I'm going to teach you this method. It might even be the most important thing that I teach you all semester. It's bigger than just astronomy. This is like skills for life kind of thing, OK? So let me show you how we're going to go about this. Um, the first thing that I want you to recognize is it's a unit conversion problem. And that means in a unit conversion problem, you've been given some number of astronomical units and you're being asked to convert it into some number of kilometers. This kind of stuff happens all the time in science, but especially in astronomy, where we're constantly changing our scale size, OK? The method that we're going to use is called dimensional analysis. And I want you guys to write down the four steps of dimensional analysis in your notebooks. Um, this is going to be a, a key piece of your notes. So I want you to put some uh, big stars next to it, because I'm going to need you to, to read this out of your notes in the future, OK? All right, step one. Step one is how do you begin? You begin by writing down the number to convert with its units. So what number would we write down to begin this problem? I'm going to erase this here and we're going to we're going to sort of we're going to simultaneously solve the problem up here as we write the steps down. So what number would I write down with units? Uh, Kim in the background says 40 AU, and Kim is correct. OK? Nice to hear from them trolls from time to time. OK, the second step is the easiest of the steps. Uh, in step two, we are going to multiply by a division bar. And the way we do that is we sort of just multiply and we put a little big fraction bar right there. We do it like that every time. That's because um, 
Conversions either involve multiplication or division. If we multiply by a division bar, we can multiply by stuff up here or divide by stuff up there. So we're kind of keeping our options open. The third step is the key to dimensional analysis. We are going to use the units to guide our thinking. So we put the units in first. to cancel. And let me show you how this works. When you see 40 astronomical units, it looks like it's sort of in the middle of the division bar, but, but that's an illusion. That's not what's really going on. I want you guys to remember that every time you write down a number, even if it's the number five, which is an incredibly stupid number, every number, even the number five, is always part of a secret fraction, OK? Because I can also write 5 as 5 divided by 1. And what that means is when you have a number just sort of sitting there, it's technically in the numerator, in the top of a little secret fraction. That also means that 40 AU is technically in the top of a secret fraction. I'm going to use this fact to cancel out the astronomical units. I'm going to put astronomical units on the bottom so that my AUs on the top whoosh, will cancel out whoosh, with AUs in the bottom. Tops and bottoms cancel out. And on the top, I'm going to put down the units that I want to convert into, which in this case is the kilometers. That's step three right there. I take this unit, I put it down there, and I put the new unit up on top. And that's how I'm going to convert them. Now that my units are in place, I can do the last step, step four. And oops. Step four is we put the numbers in second using our conversion factors. I hate writing at the bottom of the board. Hopefully you can read that. Put the numbers in second using conversion factors. Now, we need a conversion factor to convert from kilometers to AU. Where would we, where would we find such a thing? Right there, right? I gave that to you a minute ago. So I would like you to pay close attention to this part because it's not as obvious as it might seem. You've got to make sure that you keep the numbers next to the unit they go with when you put them in here uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the dimensional analysis problem. So I have a 1 next to the AU. That means I put a 1 on the bottom. I have 150 million next to the kilometers. Let me inch this over here. So I will put 150 million up at the top. And now I'm ready to use my calculator. I'm ready to use my Casio calculator. I'm going to take 40. Anything that's on top, I'll multiply. Anything that's on bottom, I'll divide. And if it's just a 1, I can kind of ignore it, if you think about it, because multiplying, dividing by 1 doesn't really change anything. So it's time for us to use the Casio. I'm going to show you how to do this here. We're going to do this together. We're going to do this times this with our Casio calculator. So follow along with me, punch after me. 40 times 150. For the times 10, we just hit EXP and then 6. And now we hit equals. That's all you got to do. It could be any simpler. Everyone who has a calculator, hold it up. I want to see that you got the same thing I did. Show them to me. Show them to me. Uh, Valentina, good. Naomi, good. Uh, Molly, good. Uh, Aaron, closer. Uh, wait, Kim? Kim, that looks good. Jenna, good. John, good. All right. Y'all making me proud. Brianna, no calculator? 
Do you have something you can use? Oh, I could do it on my phone. I'll get a calculator today too. Thank you. Okay, yeah, just use your phone, Brianna, because it's hard to understand this until you're me, but actually doing the punching, it makes it different, okay? It's different than watching. Uh, Michael, that looks good. I have a question for you, sir. Yeah, hit me. Now, when you asked about how I would do that math problem, I would have if it works for you, I would have did 40 AU multiplied by 150, got that answer, and then put uh, uh, 10 square. Nope, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work for me. And I'll tell you why, John. Because what we're doing right now is like kid stuff, baby stuff. And eventually we're going we're gonna to graduate to like tween stuff, and we might even get close to adult stuff. And as it gets more adult, and as the math gets more complicated, it's going to be important to keep some things glued together. Um, the 150 EXP6 is a single number. And God forbid I had to square that or do something funky with it, then order of operations issues will show up. So while in this case it would work, I just think it's a bad habit. When you see a number in scientific notation, do 150 EXP6. Now, if you were doing this in your head without a calculator, if all you had was an abacus, then you'd have stronger arguments to play those games. But you've got one of these, right? So let's it's a tool. We'll use it. You wouldn't try to take the lug nuts off a hubcap with your fingers. You'd, you'd use a socket wrench, right? So, all right. Uh, anyways, um, guys, we need to put this answer into a format that is acceptable to me. So what should I write down? How should we write our answer? Big thoughts. Aaron, talk to me. I, I noticed you got that that sweet uh, headset there, so talk to me with it. Speaking. Okay. <laughs> you got the number on your calculator, right? Yeah, I'm pulling it up right now. Okay. Uh, you see Damar, if I said that right, you decimar, you decimar, you decimar has got the right moves here. Uh, what do you what do you say, Aaron? Uh, I'd say six times ten to the eight or ninth. Which is so it? I'm doing I'm that. Choose. No, oh, shoot. Ninth. Good. Okay. And that's what you. Uh, I'm probably mangling your name, you Sidamar, but it's something like that. You could just call me Yudi for short. Oh, Yudi. Okay, Yudi. Yep. Yudi also had the right moves there. So it's six times. The 6.0 was a little bit creative on your part. I don't know what made you think there was one more digit of precision, but I'll nitpick you on that later. Um, in general, it would just be six times 10 to the nine. I guess, actually, no, you, Yudi actually does have a point. Yudi, there's two sig figs here, but there's only one sig fig there. So you're kind of on shaky ground, if you ask me. What are my units? Kilometers. Yep. Okay, how do I say that number in plain English? What is that? A billion. So six billion kilometers to Pluto. Okay, now listen. You might think that my method is not good because it took Michael five seconds and it took me five minutes. But that you would be wrong to assume that. Hey, Paul, I've got some things to teach you here. And this thing that I just showed you, this dimensional analysis, it's going to make your mind clear. You're going to be able to solve so many problems that were once so complicated. Now you'll see that they're all just dimensional analysis problems. This will take you so far. And it's more useful than just astronomy. These steps, they must be encoded into memory. So if you're just getting to lecture, Paul, you better write that down as fast as you possibly can because you're about to miss something that's really matters here, okay? I'm gonna be calling on you to regurgitate these steps to me. Let me give you one second. I'm gonna get iced tea and you can write that down. All right, 
Ice T achievement unlocked. Um, I'm going to erase here. Any objections? know about astronomical units. Now I can start talking to you about some other things related to the orbit of Earth. All right. Let's call up my slideshow here. I'm now going to teach you a very important vocabulary term. The term is called the ecliptic and it has two different definitions. Um, let's start with the simple one. Here you can see Earth in its orbit around the sun. The orbit, as I've mentioned, is almost, but not quite, a perfect circle. We have a name for the path of Earth, this dark blue line. It's called the ecliptic path, and it's a key vocabulary term that helps us talk smart about space. Let's write it down. This is the ecliptic definition number one. Definition number one of the ecliptic is the path of Earth around the sun. Not complicated, okay? However, I can also speak, if I would like, about the ecliptic plane. There's an op. Uh, so this, this is sometimes called the ecliptic path. When you're talking about the circle itself, you're talking about the ecliptic path. When, when I say the ecliptic plane, that means the 2D surface uh, made by the, the ecliptic. A circle kind of naturally defines a plane if you think about it, a hoop, a hula hoop defines a plane. And it turns out that not only does Earth orbit in the path of the ecliptic, but to a close approximation, almost all of the other planets in our solar system, they also orbit uh, close to the plane of the ecliptic. Let's type into Google um, the orbital inclinations of the planets. And let's see if we can find a crappy image here. This one will usually do. Uh, it's not great, but it's good enough. So Earth defines the ecliptic plane. Relative to Earth's orbit, Mercury is actually inclined a little bit extra. Seven degrees is kind of high for a planet. Venus is three degrees above and below the ecliptic plane. Mars is two degrees. Jupiter is one degree, Saturn is three degrees, Uranus is one degree, Neptune is about two degrees. Pluto is a real nutbag. Pluto is inclined by 17 degrees with respect to the ecliptic, meaning it plunges above and below the disk that, that Earth makes. Pluto's kind of weird like that, but today we think of Pluto as more of an overgrown comet than a planet. So, you know, there's nothing in the law of gravity that would prevent a planet from orbiting completely perpendicular to the ecliptic. Like, it so happens that, that Uranus and Neptune are also kind of orbiting in the ecliptic plane, but they could have orbited totally cockeyed perpendicular to Earth's orbit. The fact that all of those planets are orbiting in a disk, it says something about how our solar system formed. It's not random. There was a cohesive thing that formed our solar system, some kind of a, a giant nebula or cloud that collapsed in on itself. Why do they all form a plane? Well, because spinning objects tend to kind of flatten, kind of like a pizza, you know? We'll talk about that some other time. The important thing is the ecliptic plane is kind of like the disk of the solar system. This was definition one of the ecliptic. The problem 
with doing real astronomy is real astronomy means getting your boots on and getting your mittens on and grabbing your telescope and heading out into the woods or into the cold. Usually not the woods because trees block your view. And, and you go out somewhere that's, that's uh, a flat plane and you set up your telescope and you start looking at the sky. But when you're stuck on Earth, you're, you're in a vantage point looking out from Earth. You're not floating above the solar system like this picture here. And from an Earth-based perspective, the ecliptic is something different. Let's rotate Earth so that North is pointing up. And you'll see that the uh, equator of Earth is kind of per is sort of where the red ring is. That's the celestial equator. Now the ecliptic becomes something different. Instead of it being the path of Earth around the sun, we can reverse it and now represent the ecliptic as the path of the sun against the background stars. And I'm not talking about the daily motion of the sun. I'm not talking about rises in the east and sets in the west. I'm talking about the yearly drift the sun makes against the background stars. That's definition number two of the ecliptic. Path of the sun against the background stars. Man, doesn't this sound familiar? Doesn't this remind you of something that we talked about in lecture zero last week? This is sort of ringing a bell for me. Is it ringing a bell for anyone else? Is this how they found the, the uh, zodiacs or how the zodiacs are determined? Very good, Paul. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Paul has pointed out that we, when, when we were talking about that astrology mumbo jumbo, that great snake oil that is astrology, that astrologers are obsessed with the zodiac because those are the constellations through which the sun appears to move throughout a year, as shown in slide 56. You can see here the sun is, so this green circle is the ecliptic, but that means the sun is also projected along the ecliptic throughout the year. And, and that's very convenient, uh, Paul, because this means that the ecliptic is the zodiac. And the zodiac is the ecliptic. Holy shit. You know, if I'm out at night and I'm looking for planets, if I'm looking for Mars and Jupiter, I'm looking wherever I see zodiac constellations. If I see Taurus, if I see Gemini, if I see Sagittarius, I know that that's the disk of the solar system that I'm looking into. And I look for planets there. I don't ever look for planets near Polaris or anywhere funky like that. I hunt for planets where I can see zodiac constellations. So to an astronomer, the zodiac is interesting because it tells you where the ecliptic is on your sky. The ecliptic is tilted with respect to the so-called celestial equator. And that's because Earth is tilted relative to the ecliptic plane. Let's uh, show you another slide here. If the ecliptic is a disk, relative to that disk, eh, 21, Earth has a so-called axis tilt, a 23.5 degree axis tilt with respect to the ecliptic plane. Technically, it's with respect to the perpendicular of the ecliptic, but that's too long, didn't read. So we just say 23.5 degrees with respect to the ecliptic plane. And it maintains that 23.5 degree tilt as it orbits in a yearly fashion around the sun. Let's go back to that very interesting picture from your book. You'll see that the Earth stays tilted 23.5 degrees, and it kind of continues to point in the same direction as it spins and as it orbits around the sun. 
this has a lot of different effects. It, it, a lot depends upon this axis tilt. So Earth has an axis tilt of 23.5 degrees with respect to the ecliptic plane. One of the key effects um, is it creates these kind of key alignments between Earth and the sun that we need to talk about. But let me let the note takers catch up to me here. OK, looks like you guys are good. Um, let me show you a couple slides here. They're going to be useful to us. Um, I guess I could do this one. This one's kind of cute. Um, you can see here that as Earth orbits the sun, its axis tilt ends up making these key alignments between Earth and the sun. I'm going to try to demonstrate them with the camera here. Let's imagine that the camera, you, is the sun. Um, as, as Earth is orbiting, I'm going to imagine that my axis is tilted towards the windows there. There's an exact day that we call the summer solstice, an exact day where the, where the North Pole is tilted most directly towards the sun, like so. A day before, it's not quite tilted there. A day after, it's not quite tilted. But on the summer solstice, that's when the, the, the axis tilt is leaning. The North Pole is leaning towards the sun. That's a key day. That's called the summer solstice. Um, there's also a day called the spring equinox. That's the day where Earth is drifting and the equator, even though it's still tilted 23.5 degrees, the center of the equator is pointed most directly towards the sun right there. And that's that's a key day as well. That's the spring equinox. And and there is a winter solstice where the where the south pole is tilted towards the sun. And there's a fall equinox, which is the, the opposite of the spring equinox. Let's take some notes on these. I call them four key points in Earth's orbit. They are the spring equinox, which occurs roughly around March 21st. The summer solstice which occurs around June 21st. The uh, fall equinox, sometimes called the vernal equinox, but sorry, or uh, the autumnal equinox. We'll use simple terms and we'll just call it the fall equinox. That's around September 21st. And then there's the winter solstice. Um, that's around uh, December 21st. Class, if you had to guess, let's go back to our slide here with uh, perihelion and aphelion. If you had to guess what month perihelion occurs in, what would you guess? What time of year does perihelion occur at? Summer solstice? You'd think so, right? What if I told you that it occurs in January? What if I told you that aphelion, when it's farthest from the sun, that's like, I think, in July or something. That'd be pretty messed up, wouldn't it? It turns out that the change of seasons has nothing to do with that slight change in distance between Earth and the sun. The change in seasons is an entirely due 
to the axis tilt of Earth. That's what makes cold winters and warm summers. Let's take a look and see how that works, because that's going to be one of your first homework problems on Wednesday. Uh, class, uh, what day of the year is this? Is it summer solstice? Nope. Winter? Yeah, it's the winter solstice. How did you know? Because Rhode Island's in the cold. <laughs> okay, well, um, sort of. I would, uh, I don't, I've got to think about whether I agree with the way you said that or not. You no, definitely, have, not. you have the right answer. Sure. I, I would have said it differently. I would have said, you can see here, let me move this little thing. You can see that the North Pole is tilted away from the sun. The sun is over here, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the direction of sunlight. So yes, in the cold, right now it's in the shadows, but th that's the dark, that's the nighttime side of earth. I yes, it is colder at the nighttime side. So whatever you said wasn't entirely wrong. It just sounded wrong. It sounded weird to me, okay? <laughs> um, the, the better answer is the South Pole is tilted towards the sun. The North Pole is tilted away from the sun, right? That's an easier way to say it. But okay, we're learning, we're trying. Um, eh, eh. I want you guys to imagine that I had two flashlights. Um, if you, you know, take a walk outside today, it's a nice sunny day. It's quite cold, but if you stand in the sunlight, you feel warmer. And that's because light is a form of energy and it can heat you up like you're a rock uh, baking in the sun. So I want you guys to imagine that I have two flashlights which are identical, and they each have identical beams of energy of the same uh, width coming out of them. Sorry, I'm trying to move stuff around here. I'm fighting the computer system. Um, on the system on the right, the flashlight is perpendicular to the ground, and so all of the light is spread over this circle. And over here, we have the flashlight striking the ground at an oblique angle, and the sunlight is spread over here. Now, which patch of ground rock do you suspect is going to be warmer? The patch on the, sorry, whoops, I'm having issues here. The patch on the left or the patch on the right? Which is going to be the warmer, the warmer patch of ground? The left? I would say the left, John. Uh, well, I'm sorry, John pointed the right, but I, I, I debated that. Who said the left? Michael. Michael, where are you? Oh, hi, Michael. Uh, Michael, I agree. Why, Michael, why would you say the left? I mean, intuitively speaking, it just kind of seems like the direct light going straight at the spot versus at an angle would be. Now, they're, they're the same distance away. The, the distance is roughly the same. So it's not an issue of distance, but it's an issue of angle. And yeah. what's different about this light than that light? I'm, I'm trying to see if you guys can put your finger on it here. I, I don't know. It's focused. Okay, it's focused. Yes, that is true. That's kind of what I'm trying to get at, but look, there's the another- The angle looks different a little. One looks like it's covering more area, so it would take longer to heat it up. Who's talking to me right now? That's the person I want to talk to. Uh, Molly. Are you a troll? I am a troll. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. So Molly the troll, um, you said the right words. I was looking for the word area. These beams contain an equal amount of energy, but the energy on the left is concentrated in a smaller unit of area, whereas this beam of energy is spread over a larger unit of area. If you have twice the cake and half the frosting, it's not going to be as good, right? If you spread that energy over a wider area, it's not going to be as efficient as heating up that ground rock. Okay, Molly the troll. Let's go back a page for a second. Suppose I were to number these beams of sunlight here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Which beam would you say is the most effective at heating up the ground rock of Earth on the day of the winter solstice? Uh, I would say four. No. Or no, three. 
three. Why three? Um, it looks like it's the closest rays to the. No, it's not about distance. Closest is wrong. Say it better. Or I'm sorry, it's co it's the closest air or not closest like the area. Um, we need to use some geometry terms here. Distance. What about this ray that the other rays don't do? It's someone yeah. help Molly. Is it Molly. that it's concentrated? Like the light will be more concentrated. The light will be concentrated there, but why will the light be the most concentrated there? It's straight on. Area, straight on. It's most direct. I'm looking for yeah. <gasps> The word I'm looking for here, kids, is perpendicular. When two lines meet and make a capital T, perpendicular lines. Did you ever have to learn that shit? Okay, listen, perpendicular lines, that's the secret here. When the, when the rays are perpendicular, right, that's when you'll have the sunlight most concentrated. So on December 21st, what should be the warmest place on Earth? What is this? Peru? My geography kind of sucks. Let's use my globe. I guess the best place to be is in the Atkama Mountains of Chile or in Paraguay, right? Or Rio de Janeiro. That sounds more exciting. Let's hit the beach and drink pina coladas in Rio de Janeiro. What do you say? Because it's summertime down there right now. That's right. Axis tilt is the cause of seasons. Let's take a note about that. And one thing that's true about the axis tilt is the more you tilt, the more extreme the variation in the angle of sunlight becomes. For instance, if we're tired of thinking of planet Earth, what if you could take a trip to the planet Uranus, which has an axis tilt of 96 degrees? Basically, Uranus is tilted towards the sun. It also has an orbital period of like uh, 86 years or something. So for like, for like 43 years, only the northern hemisphere of Uranus gets sunlight. Basically, a day on Uranus is like 84 years or something. So for like for like for like 42 years, only the north pole, only the northern hemisphere gets sunlight. And for the next 40 years, only the southern hemisphere gets sunlight. That causes extreme seasonal variations that drive convective winds from north to south throughout the gas clouds of Uranus. It's kind of a weird planet, to be honest. So one of the things we discover is the more you tilt, more tilt is more seasons. And that's at least up to 90 degrees. After 90 degrees, it starts to go the other way again. Oh, I was going to ask you something. I was going to try to trick you or something. What? Oh, yeah. Hey, what's the definition of seasons? Anyone? Simple definition of seasons. What do I mean by that? <coughs> Thought so. Okay. Let's do that. Seasons means... Variation in temperature over the course of a planetary orbit. In the case of Earth, it would be variation in temperature over a year, but not every planet takes a year to go around the sun. So that's something to think about. So I'm talking about like seasons means how drastic do the temperatures vary over the course of an orbit. 
one of your homework problems next time is going to be about that. OK, if I'm clever and if I'm smart, I think I have time for one more little module. We're going to shift, uh, we're going to shift our goals here for a second. I'm done talking about the orbit of Earth for now. I can't do anything else with you until I give you a little lesson about angles, OK? We're going to have a talk about angles and what's called angular size. I'm erasing. So one of the first things that I'd like to talk to you about is that you see angles, not sizes. And this is true for your eyeball as well uh, as for a telescope. For instance, consider rainbow ball here. Rainbow ball is about 15 centimeters in diameter. But that's not what you see. You don't see 15 centimeters. When rainbow ball is close to your face, rainbow ball takes up your entire field of vision. And it has a large angular size. As rainbow ball moves further and further away from you, the observer, the angle it subtends becomes smaller. Obviously, the actual diameter of rainbow ball is not changing. But what you see is changing because you don't see 15 centimeters. You see angles. That's true whether it's rainbow ball, whether it's my iced tea, whether it's the moon or the sun or a galaxy or whatever. Let's draw a picture of what that looks like. Usually, you're looking at some astronomical object like the moon, for instance. Usually, it's a sphere, and that sphere has some diameter or size, which I'm going to call S. And you, the observer, are somewhere on Earth, somewhere far away from that astronomical object, and you're looking at it. And that thing subtends some angle in your field of view. The angle that the moon or the sun subtends is its angular size. And I'm going to use the Greek letter theta to represent angular size. It's just a zero with a line through it. Angular size can be measured in a bunch of different units. First, let's talk about an experience you might have had at some point. Um, maybe one night you went out, say, around October 31st, and you saw a big orange moon coming up over the horizon. And you said to yourself, whoa, dude, the moon is huge, right? Have you ever seen a huge moon coming up over the horizon? Next time you see one of those huge moons, one of those really impressive, big, scary looking moons, I want you to take your finger and hold it out at arm's length and compare the width of your fingernail to the moon. And you'll discover that that crazy big moon subtends about half the width of your finger. Now, put your finger away, admire the moon, and then later on at night when the moon gets higher in the sky, it won't be orange anymore, it'll be white. And it won't look as big to your eyes anymore. Take your finger back out and hold it up to that white disk of a moon. And you'll discover that the moon is still exactly half the width of your finger. The angular size has not changed at all, but your perception of the moon has. This is a psychological or a perceptual effect, and it is known as the moon illusion. Your brain is tricked into thinking the moon looks big when you see it against a foreground of trees and mountains and rivers and cactuses. If you see it behind all of that stuff and it's half the width of your finger, your brain thinks, holy cow, that thing is huge. But when the moon is high up on the sky, it doesn't look as impressive anymore 
because you have nothing, no reference point to compare it against. Um, so in that case, the angular size doesn't even change, but your brain does. Now, there are different units we can use for angular size. There's three different units we're going to be using in our class. The first is the degree. And probably if you guys took a geometry course at some point, you're familiar with the degrees. Uh, a degree is 1 360th of a circle. And the Greeks invented degrees, I think. I think. Um, take a circle, slice it into 360 pieces of pizza, and one of those little pizza slices is one degree. So we say one degree is defined as a 360th of a circle. But probably a more elegant way to say it is one circle equals 360 degrees. For example, the angular size of the moon happens to be half a degree. That's the approximate angular size of the moon. And by a weird coincidence of nature, the angular size of the sun also happens to be half a degree. That's a pretty wild coincidence because the sun and the moon are not the same size and they're not the same distance. But the, the mishmash of the two is just right so that from time to time when they line up with each other, you can get this lovely effect, a total solar eclipse, where the disk of the moon perfectly blocks the disk of the sun, and uh, the daytime sky goes dark. You do get a little bit of light from the sun. This light is from an outer wispy layer of the sun's atmosphere called the corona. The coronavirus and the corona are both named after crown. Anyways, this corona came first. Uh, uh, and the corona beer came second, and the coronavirus came third. OK, so this light is from an outer wispy layer of the sun. So forget about that for now. Basically, this disk, this half a degree disk of the moon is the exact same size as the disk of the sun. Um, because there are slight changes in the distance between the sun and the moon, there are certain times where you can have a rare type of an eclipse called an annular eclipse. That's when the moon is just a little bit farther away uh, from, from the Earth than the sun. And then you can get something like this. This is a very rare type of an eclipse where the angular size of the moon shrinks to just under half a degree. And then you can see the outer disk of the sun poking out as a ring of fire. So these are really rare and delightful uh, eclipses to witness. We'll talk more about eclipses in our next class. If you think about it, uh, OK, well, hmm, I got two things to do here. I don't want to do this. There are other units that we could use for angular size. The moon and the sun, they're kind of like the largest astronomical objects we can look at. Anything else that we look at after that is going to be a very, very small angle. It's going to be a planet, or it's going to be a star, or a galaxy. And sometimes it's helpful to have even tinier angles. So besides the degree, I'm going to have to erase here, if, if you don't mind. We can invent two other units. Uh, the second one is called the arc minute. An arc minute, which is in the, uh, uh, represented with an apostrophe, one apostrophe, is defined as 1 60th of one degree. So it's kind of just like, like a minute is to an hour. We have 1 degree is equal to 60 arc minutes. And then sometimes we need really, really tiny angles called arc seconds. 
and arc second is one uh, with a double apostrophe, and that's defined as a 60th of one arc minute, one arc minute contains 60 arc seconds. We're going to be using arc minutes and arc seconds in our homework on Wednesday. So I'm going to give you some training with that eventually. Let me uh, tickle your imaginations here by showing you kind of a cool photograph. My buddy, Bob Horton, oh, shit. who's, um, um, uh oh, someone having a freak out back there? Audio. Oh, no. Okay. Um, hey, who's who's forgotten to mute themselves? You're a troll. Now I gotta find the trolls. Chat. Uh, 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 hey, Riley, shut the hell up. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so don't forget I to mute. Where that never gets old, professor. <laughs> You're so rude to your classmates. Well. Sometimes people are like fighting with their kids and stuff. It's like, you know, it's a good idea to mute yourself unless you have some, by all means, if you have something to say or a question to ask, feel free to unmute yourself and talk. But until then you might want to mute yourself. That's how the etiquette works here. Okay. Uh, anyways, I was doing something. I was going to show you a picture that my buddy Bob Horton took. He is a member of the skyscrapers, the local Rhode Island Astronomical Society. They do all kinds of cool stuff. I'll tell you about them some other time. Check out this cool picture that he took of the, uh, probably from Prospect Park. You can see the, the skyline of Providence here, and you can see some of the brightest objects in the nighttime sky. That's Venus, that's Jupiter, and this is the brightest star in the sky. It's known as Sirius. It's actually up uh, right yeah. now. If, if, if the skies are clear tonight, you can see Sirius. I was checking it out this weekend. Oh, wow, Jenny. Hey, Austin, shut the hell up. Okay. Anyways, notice that the planet- I'm not even unmuted. I'm, I'm trying to mute you. You, you. you were unmuted. I had to manually mute you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So anyways, notice that the planets are much brighter than the stars. That's something that you notice right off the bat. But the angular sizes of the planets are also- greater than that of the stars. In the follow-up photograph, he's taken a small telescope and attached it to his camera. And notice when he zooms in on the planets, when he increases their angular size, you can now see Jupiter as a disk and the four Galilean moons next to it. And here you can see Venus in some kind of a gibbous phase. That's pretty cool. So you can actually see the disk of the planets. Now, I happen to know that the angular size of Jupiter, of this disk, is roughly one arc minute. So people usually use arc minutes to describe the angular sizes of planets, but stars and moons, they might be like arc seconds would be better for those. In any case, um, whether you're using degrees, arc minutes or arc seconds, you can relate the angular size to the size of a planet by a famous formula. This will be the very last note that I give you today because I'm almost, I'm pretty much out of time. But let me just get one last thing down, one last note. We can relate angular size to the size and to the distance by a sort of legendary formula in astronomy. It's known as the small angle formula. And the small angle formula tells us that the size of your star, the diameter, is the angular size times the distance times 2 pi over 360 degrees. Here, S represents the size, usually measured in kilometers. Theta is the angular size in degrees, and D is the distance to the star or moon, also measured in kilometers. Mm. 
Normally when I introduce a formula, I will sort of practice that formula with you. Um, but I'm not gonna do that today because I'm out of time and you're probably getting a little zapped out here. So let's make a note to selves. The next time we'll do a sample problem with a small angle formula. We're gonna be using that in our homeworks on Wednesday. So maybe it'll be better to save it until then. All right, let's talk about what happens next. Uh, we're gonna do a lab after this. Today's our lab one. Uh, I usually like to give the students a little 10 or 15, maybe a 15 minute break, just to let you chill for a second, have a snack, cup of coffee. I usually drink some tea. Does everyone like that idea before we launch into our lab? I think we can crank out our lab. I try to keep it, I give myself an hour and a half, but. I try to I try to make it as fast as possible because I know you guys have stuff to do. Um, one thing I'll say is while we're taking our break, if you could please go to the lab, I told the students earlier, and print out the first page of the lab. We're gonna need this page, just the first page. There are other pages, but we can skip those. We're just gonna do page one of our problem set here. Um, and, and, and that's under lab one powers of 10. So you go to Blackboard. Let's see if, if I can do this with you here. You go to Blackboard, you go to the Lab tab, Powers of 10, and this PDF, if you open it up, will look like this. And I just want you to print out that page. If you do not have a printer, you're gonna have to write this stuff all down, write the questions down so that we can do that lab together, okay? But that can I be something a, you do during your tea break. I had a quick question. Sure, ask me. Um, so for the labs that we're doing, um, I ha haven't printed them off quite yet, but when I do, are we, and we're doing these together after we finish, are we uh, just like scanning these and re uploading them into our labs? Is that That's fine? Yes. If you're doing this live with me, let's just get it done and get it over with and, and scan it and do it. Perfect. So, so listen, I Molly, that with you and scan it back into this, to the upload portion. Yeah. At the end of lab, I'm going to give you guys a little tutorial on how to do that. Cause that'll be some of your first time doing that. So Molly, we'll get to that bridge when it, we come to it. But meanwhile, Molly, I'm gonna pause the recording and I'm gonna have a cup of tea. Okay. Can you print out just that one page? That shouldn't take you too long, right? Just one print, one printed page? Yeah, yep, I can print it off. Just that first page, okay? Okay, okay guys, um, it's currently 1.33. I'll see you a little after uh, 1.45, 1.50, something like that. I'm gonna just, however long it takes me to have a cup of tea. So take a break for safety's sake and I'll see you in a bit. Uh, class, I am so sorry. In the process of starting this lab, I forgot to hit record. And that's a really bad thing. I cannot forget to do that ever again. The people watching this video later will have missed a part of this lab. So uh, what I'm going to say is they can, if they want to see what they missed, they can, they can watch the last semester's lab, uh, lab one but I also show them the answers that we got this far so that they can at least catch up with us. I'm, I can't believe I forgot to unpause the recording. That was a real boneheaded thing to do. So I need to, I need to make a note to myself to not do that again. Anyways, we're recording now. Let's have a discussion about measurement, okay? I'm gonna go over here to my phone. All right, so for those of you just tuning in, because I screwed up, <clears throat> um, we're working on the first page of our lab here, the powers of 10 lab, and we put our names in our section. And so far we've just been practicing using our EXP key instead of times 10 on our calculators here. So we've done the first four calculations like I said, you can watch them in uh, one of the other videos that have lab one on them. And I'll give you guys a link to those uh, when I post this video today. In any case, we're currently talking about 2C and 2C uh, involves dividing 3.2 times 10 to the nine by 2.4 times 10 to the five. And when we did that, We got this number, 
Paul has rounded it to 1.3 times 10 to the four and put it into scientific notation. This is going to lead into a discussion about something that we call precision or tolerance. And I'm gonna use that phone to demonstrate here. Okay. When I write a number down in scientific notation, 1.23456 times 10 to the seven. This part of the number <clears throat> is related to the measurement and it's called the precision. A machinist might call it a tolerance. It means how good was my measurement? This part of the number tells you your order of magnitude and your order of magnitude tells you how big is your number. For instance, 10 to the power of seven means a number of order 10 million because 10 to the power of seven is a one with seven zeros after it. Okay, precision or tolerance comes from the tools that you use to take a measurement. In the case of this little ruler here, <clears throat> you can see that it's graded down to the centimeter and even down to the millimeter level. Remember from today's discussion, all of those little black tick marks are, uh, are a millimeter. So I can write, if I want one centimeter is equal to 10 millimeters, I can also write that one millimeter is equal to a 10th of a centimeter. Those are two different ways of saying the same thing. A millimeter is a 10th of a centimeter. If I want to measure something larger, like, like a person, I might make use of a couple of meter sticks here. You can see that although dirty from repeated use on the chalkboard, my ruler stick is graded down to the centimeter and even down to the millimeter level, suggesting that if I were to take a measurement of the height of a person like me, I might want to make use of this tool and measure down to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. In other words, a measurement of a person could have a tolerance of plus or minus a tenth of a centimeter. And let's go ahead and watch me take a measurement of myself as a means of demonstration, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand up, kind of angle the camera here, and I'll start with one of my meter sticks down here by my hip. I'll put the other one there. And just to kind of make the job a little better, come on, let me move this thing that's blocking it. Okay. I'll take a, a ruler and I'll kind of put it on the top of my head and I'll clamp it down. And I just observed 180.3 centimeters, okay? And I want you guys to work with me while I take this measurement. So this is the height of your lab instructor, okay? I got 180.3 centimeters. Let's say that I were to take this and I were to etch it into a stone tablet and bury it in the Sahara Desert. <clears throat> and thousands of years from now, archeologists were to dig it up and they were to look at this number where I recorded the height of the professor. They could say, look at this here dude. This here dude took the time to measure himself to the nearest 10th of a centimeter. The fact that he said 180.3 meant it wasn't 180.2, nor was it 180.4. He was taking the time to measure himself, not just to 180, but down to that third tick mark that comes after 180. His tolerance is plus or minus 10th of a centimeter. In other words, when you write a number down, it conveys inherent information about the quality of the measurement. One way we could say, uh, talk about the quality of this measurement is we could say that this number has four significant figures. And the reason why it has four significant figures is because each of the numbers tells us something about the measurement. This tells you I'm over 100 centimeters. This tells you I'm close to 180. This tells you I'm three little tick marks above the 80. Another way to look at this number is to say, 
since there are four digits, this number has a one part in a thousand precision. And it's one part in a thousand because if you measure to the nearest dime out of a hundred bucks, that's the same quality as measuring to the nearest dollar out of a thousand bucks. You're basically breaking your measurement up into a thousand parts or more and keeping track of each part. If you take a measurement that's at the one part in a thousand precision level, that's actually a pretty sensitive measurement, even for a pretty crappy student lab. It's so sensitive, in fact, that if I were to take this measurement again, I'm not sure that I would get the same value. And that's because there are any small deviation in my process could lead to a slightly different measurement. And this is what are called random errors or the noise. This is inherent in any measurement. Let's go ahead and try it again and see if we can make some noise, all right? So I'll put this meter stick down. I'll take the same measurement I did before. Stand here. Meter stick at the top of my head. And this time I got 179.2. So there was quite a bit, quite a bit of measurement noise there, if you can see what, what happened. Let's take a peek. Let me write down my second measurement. Students, both of these measurements were valid measurements. One time I got 180.3, the other time I got 179.2. What is the truth about my height? Am I really 179.2 centimeters? Or am I really 180.3 centimeters tall? Which number should I trust more? Maybe an average? I could take an average. Um, that's not a bad idea, Michael. Although <clears throat> if I take an average, that assumes that I'll probably get a number somewhere in between there. Of course, if I took another measurement, it could be between these two, but it, it might even be outside of them, right? That's a possibility as well. To be really sure, we'd probably have to take a lot of measurements, like a thousand, and take the average of that many. But we don't have time for that because we have other things to do with our day. So why don't we take one more measurement and we'll see what happens, okay? So we'll take a third measurement of my height, same as before. Okay, so stand up, put the ruler down. And this time I got 181.1. So I did kind of a crappy job because I was trying to dance in front of the camera here, but 100. notice that this time I'm fluctuating by almost a centimeter. So I'm doing a kind of a lousy job. I have poor precision here. Um, let's go ahead and take the average, just like Michael suggested. And we're, we're going to work through this lame exercise together. So we're just going to do 180.3 plus 179.2 plus 181.1. We're going to hit equals, shoot. And then we're going to divide by three. Damn it. Ah, oh, this is not what I wanted. Okay, it turns out that I made a mistake. <laughs> Suppose I had measured 181.2. Let's try taking the average of those two. 180, I, I, there's a point to what I'm trying to get at here. So just work with me for a second. 180.3 plus 179.2 plus 181.2, okay? And now let's divide this number by three. And that's the number that comes out of my calculator. The moral of today's story, the moral of this lesson is that just because your calculator spits out a bunch of numbers does not mean that those numbers are true or have anything to do with reality. I hate to sound like our former president, but there are real numbers and there are fake numbers. And your job is to know the difference between the two, okay? So what should we round this number to if we're going to be honest about the quality of our measurements?
Someone's chatting me here. Let me see what they're saying. What's happening in the Chatterbox Cafe? Stop the count. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Pretty good, Austin. All right. Come on, someone play with me here. What, what should I round this number to? Does anyone what? fucking understand what I'm talking about? I have well, no idea. Keep it to 180. Believe it or not, that would be throwing away some of your hard work. Because, sorry? Uh, I was, I was going to say 180.24. That would be lying. That would be lying, lying about the quality of your measurement. So this is a case of Goldilocks in the, th in the three roundings, OK? Each of these numbers has one, two, three, four significant figures of goodness. Each of these measurements was done to the nearest tenth of a centimeter with a one part in a thousand precision. One of the rules is the quality of your output is determined by the quality of your input. So you can keep the same number of sig figs for your final answer that you had for your input values. So what should I round it to? Zach, you're muted. 180.2. Now you're with me. See, because Zach, none of these numbers are real because my measurements were not good to that level of goodness. I did not measure myself to the nearest billionth of an atom or something. I only measured myself to the nearest millimeter. You see what I'm saying? The moral of the story is that the number of sig figs that you keep here is related to the number of sig figs going in. Now, sig figs can be a little awkward to talk about. That's one of the things that I wanted to discuss in this lab. One of the reasons we're only doing the first page is kind of so that I could yap at you for a little bit, OK? Let's start off with the number 2,000. The number 2,000 has one significant figure. That's because if you tell someone that you have $2,000, you're only telling them how much money you have to the nearest thousand dollar bill. Perhaps you, you know, had something like one thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars, but you didn't want to get into all that. Two thousand dollars means I'm telling you roughly how much money I have at the thousand dollar bill level. If you tell someone that you have two hundred and twenty dollars, I'm sorry, if you tell someone that you have two thousand two hundred dollars, that number has two significant figures because you're telling someone how much money you have to the nearest $100 bill. Likewise, $2,220, that's three sig figs, because now you're telling your friends how much money you have down to the nearest $10 bill. What if I tell you that I have $2,002? How many significant figures does that number have? Two. Four. Oh. I know it's a little confusing. That's kind of the point of this exercise, Jenna. The reason why it's four significant figures is sometimes zeros do matter. Jenna, if I tell you that I have $2,002, I wouldn't have bothered telling you about the $2 unless I wanted you to know how much money I had down to the nearest dollar bill. Do you see what I mean? For instance, if I had $2,001, I wouldn't go through the trouble of saying I have $2,002 unless I just felt like being a total liar. Let's assume that I'm not a total liar. Then I would probably be being honest down to the nearest dollar bill. That means each of these numbers matter. And Jenna, it's even worse when it's small numbers. For instance, this number, um, this number has three significant figures. When you put a zero on that side of the decimal point, it counts. This number here has one significant figure. Only the five counts. And this number here has two significant figures. Only those two count. It's kind of weird how this works. Now, one of the cool things about scientific notation Scientific notation is good because it kind of naturally gets rid of the crappy numbers that aren't significant, and it keeps the numbers that are significant. So for instance, let's imagine you put 2,000 into scientific notation. Jenna, how would you put 2,000 into scientific notation? What would I do? Um, two times 10 to the third. Exactly. 
And notice, uh, Jenna, only the two is left and the zeros disappeared. Jenna, what about 2,200? 2.2 .2 times 10 to third. So notice that when you put things into scientific notation, it's kind of naturally keeping the numbers that are significant. Now, if I were to put this into scientific notation, Jenna, I would actually write 2.002 times 10 to the third, because all of those are significant. And if I was going to put that into scientific notation, I would make it 5.0 for those two times 10 to the negative two. Scientists love to put numbers into scientific notation because it makes it very obvious to the reader how good the precision of the measurement is. Scientists, especially astronomers and physicists and chemists, are obsessed with the quality of measurements. Sometimes deep science is hidden in there. Okay, let's go back to our problem of 2C. Class, how many significant figures does the top number have? Two. Two. How many does the bottom have? Two. So how many do I get to keep when I round it? Two. Now, do this for me. Without putting this number into scientific notation, what should I round this to, to be honest? If I can only keep two significant figures, don't do any scientific notation, just round it. What would I round this number to if I wanted it to have two significant figures? 1.3. False. That's called molesting the number. You are not allowed to molest the number. You are allowed to round the number. This is a number of order 10,000. You cannot change that into a number 1.3. I think you're confusing rounding and scientific notation. They're different issues. I want you to round, not scientific notation. So try it again. 13,000. That's what I wanted to hear, Paul. 13,000. Now, once we round it, I'm sorry, well, that was the rounding part. Once we put it into scientific notation, and this is probably where that person was getting confused, then we can make it 1.3 times into the four. So Paul G naturally did some good rounding. Let's check out some of the other ones and see how we did. Was this rounded appropriately? Yes or no? Yes. How yes. about here? Was that rounded appropriately? No. No, there's two. There's two where? Explain. And uh, in the numerator, there's, there's uh, or is there three? There's three in the numerator. Mm. There's two in the denominator. Denominator, yeah, yeah. So when there's three in the numerator and two in denominator, how many do we keep? You keep the lower value, so it'd be two. That's right. You always go with your shittiest, crappiest number. The crappiest number pollutes your answer. So we did actually round this appropriate. 4.8 was correct. How about up here? Did we round this one appropriate? By the way, this also has the advantage of going over the earlier problems. Sorry, people watching the video. I kind of screwed this up today. Did we round this appropriate? Yes. Yes, we did. How about here? No. What should we have rounded this answer to? Two sig figs. So help me do that, Zach. Um, it would just be 1.8. That's right. But you keep the times 10 to the 9. That's safe. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So if we were doing this more honestly, and there was no shame in that game because we hadn't talked about it yet, I would have made this 1.8 times 10 to the 9. That's good. Okay. Um, actually, I want to point something out. In our class going forward, um, rounding is a lifelong journey that we're going to learn to do. In general, when, I, when we're doing our homeworks, when in doubt, round to two sig figs and you're usually good. Okay. If you don't know what you're doing, round to two sig figs. Let's see if we can do this one right though. Let's punch this in. Let's see if you guys can do it. Okay. Prove to me that I've taught you something. Take your calculators and do this this time without me and tell me what you get.
Tell me what you got. <clears throat> Hold that up, Valentina. Looks good, buddy. Okay, Valentina, talk me through that, okay? Unmute yourself. I know, I'm picking on you again. Um, Valentina, that's what I got too. So let's look at our inputs. How many significant figures does the top number have? Six. How many significant um, figures does the bottom number have? Four. So how many should I keep? Four. Very good. You've learned nicely. Now tell me what to write then. So we get 5.431. Uh-huh. But hold on, Valentina, you're forgetting something. That's kind of important, right? That's your uh -huh. power of ten. The power of 10 is sacred. It's like blessed by Jesus. You can't mess with that, okay? That's not part of the rounding. That's something that's sacred. So what are you going to do? Okay. Times 10 to the power of 14. Excellent. Okay. And that's our answer. Very good. Let's take a look over here. How are we doing on time? Ah, took about an hour. Okay, um, this is what we're gonna turn in, just that first page. Now, uh, everyone take a good look at that and make sure that you have all the answers that I have in the same form that I have them in. And don't forget your name in AS1010 and your section. Let's talk about how we end the lab. First of all, I wanna once again apologize to those watching the video later. After tea break, I need to remember to hit unpause and I always do, except I didn't this time. Uh, luckily, you can watch this lab. I did it with my 1020 class last week and I did it uh, with the, the 1010 class last semester. So I just wanna show you guys how this works here. This is for the people watching later. If you want to see the first uh, 20 minutes or so that you missed, and this might just be good to know in general, if you guys go to my YouTube channel, if you just, uh, I put all of these videos on YouTube, just look up Brendan Britton and you'll see them all. And for instance, I did lab one at 1020 and it's a, pretty much the same as this lab. So those of you who want to catch what you missed, will just click on this video. You might have to forward way the hell ahead to like, an hour and 30 minutes and then you'll start the lab. But that's if that's if you wanna go back and see what you missed. It's important that you guys know how to use those calculators. The reason why we're stopping um, a little early here is because this is our first lab and I wanna make sure that you guys know how we submit that uh, to Blackboard. Um, the first thing is the usual method is gonna to be to just take a photograph of this page I think it works a little better when you send it to your computer and you upload it from there. Now you can upload this from your phone, but what's important is when you guys upload stuff, let's take a look here. I want a couple of you to try to upload this so that I can see uh, what your submissions look like. And I want all of you guys to kind of watch what these submissions look like. So you go to your lab powers of 10, you click on that. There's a button here browse local files and you can upload your picture. Only certain formats will do. You can give me a JPEG, you can give me a PDF. If you use an equation editor, you can give me a dot doc, but usually most people will just take a picture of their lab sheet or their notebook or whatever. And then I can look at it in my needs grading section. Let's see if any of you have submitted yet. Notice that Philemon and Savannah and a couple of people have already well, some people already did homework one. That's Craig. Let's take a look at Philemon's uh, submission and let's see if I like the way it looks. So when this loads, I want to see a preview. Philemon's looks great. When I open it up, I can see it in the box. He's done everything that I wanted him to do. So he's going to get a 10 out of 10. And let's check the next person, uh, Gianna. 
Hers also looks great. Nice, neat handwriting, and I can see everything. She's got her name in her section. That's what I want to see from you guys, okay? Now, listen. Things that I noticed last semester when I did this, if you start the upload and then you, like, close out of your browser, sometimes it gets caught in, like, an endless spiral of death and it doesn't upload. And sometimes people actually, like, submitted stuff, but it didn't. Please make sure that you can see it in the box and you get a confirmation. Because with so many students, if, if, if someone doesn't turn in a lab, I'm just going to mark it as zero and move on. It's kind of hard to keep track of every individual person. You know what I mean? It's really important that you guys keep on top of that and keep checking your grades because it's hard for me to do it 168 times a week. Okay. Do you guys have any questions for me? All this seems pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Sorry, I have a question. There's two, um, there's two other pages. What are we doing with those? Are those just for us to keep or? Yeah, um, when we do labs in person, if the class is doing well, I sometimes do those pages. But honestly, I figured between talking to people, fiddling with my phone and showing you how to upload, there's just a little less you can do over digital. I, yeah, basically, just throw them away. Use them as scrap paper. Sorry about that. I tried telling you to print only the first page. Sometimes we won't do every page of the lab, and this is one of those times. Are you cool with that, Molly? Or whoever I was talking Yeah, I about? just, it was Molly. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't like half submitting it. Very good. I understand that concern. Okay, yep, we just did that first page. This first lab, we're keeping it kind of easy uh, this week, okay? Now, on Wednesday, we'll be doing our homeworks. I have one other announcement before I stop, kind of important. I am obligated to do verification of enrollment at the end of this week. Anyone who has not submitted either a homework or a lab will basically be marked as a no-show and will be automatically dropped from the class. Now, luckily, that's not going to be any of you because you're all going to upload your labs like right now before you forget, right? Okay, please don't forget. And for anyone watching later, please get that in by the end of the week so that you don't accidentally get dropped from the class. Okay, that's all I got for today. Any other questions? All right. Well, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thanks for being a good sport. Sorry about the uh, half recording, but we'll get better next time. Over and out, class. <laughs>